Hi there, welcome to Openness. If you're watching this video, chances are you're high in the trade Openness, which is one of the big five. So in this video, we're gonna do three things. The very first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna do a deep dive into Openness. What is Openness? What are the different facets of Openness? What's the trade description? And we're really going to try to figure out exactly what the key motivations are for people that are high in openness. And this is gonna allow you and me and everyone, it'll allow us to put ourselves in those shoes a little bit more so we could see what life is like for someone that's high in openness. The second thing we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about how to identify uh, people that are high in openness. Uh, if you met someone for, for the very first time, how would you know that they're high in openness? Uh, if it's someone that you've known for a very long time, Maybe it's a friend or a relative. How would you know if they're high in openness? And then once you know that they're high in openness, what does that mean? What's the best way to communicate with them? And, and then also, out of all the models, the reason why this model is my favorite is because it has the highest predictive value. So we'll talk about life outcomes. What can you predict about their life? As they say, character is destiny, if someone's high in openness. And then the third thing we're gonna talk about is how high openness plays with the other traits. Because no one is just one thing. And so you might be high in openness, but you might also be you know, high in extroversion or neuroticism, conscientiousness. So are there areas of, that complement each other and areas that conflict? Um, also in a team setting, if someone is high in openness and someone's high in neuroticism or conscientiousness, what does that dynamic look like? So we're gonna explore all that in this video. But first, if you haven't taken the test, you can do so below uh, by clicking the link. And it's a very quick test. In a few minutes, you kind of have an idea of of where you are uh, in terms of the big five traits. And then second, if you have any questions feel free to co or comments, feel free to ask below. You can also text or email me, which is provided here. And be sure to subscribe and like, it helps tremendously. So without further ado, let's jump in. Openness, so what is it exactly? Um, if we use the Jordan Peterson model, there's two major facets. The first one is openness itself, which is associated with aesthetics, beauty, uh, imagination and then there's also intellect which is uh, associated with having interest in ideas um, when it comes to the openness uh, some of those trait characteristics are like someone that enjoys beauty someone that enjoys nature uh, someone that's very reflective uh, that deeply feels uh, or deeply enjoys let's say music they deeply get immersed in these things that's someone that also daydreams um, People that are high in openness will have an appreciation for the arts, they have an appreciation for music, and um, they're going to have like a depth of feeling. Intellect. Um, this is essentially the interest in ideas. And someone that's high in intellect is able to do a number of things very easily um, with great effect. So first, they're able to um, handle a lot of information. So. Not only are they able to handle a lot of complex information, they're able to absorb it. Uh, they're able to solve complex problems using this information. They're able to take parts of the information that are abstract or unknowable and mitigate those unknowns. And then they're able to quickly form clear ideas based on, on this information. So they're able to put it to use. People that are high in Intellect tend to be people that are very philosophical, uh, intellectuals, uh, any, any sort of role that requires um, thinking quickly, uh, being creative in, in thought, exploring thoughts and ideas. That's basically going to be what intellect is. Uh, it's also associated with high IQ. And it's the best predictor of lo uh, long-term life outcomes. So in terms of high openness versus low openness, someone that's high in openness is going to be original. A low openness is gonna be conventional. Uh, have a lot of imagination and daydreaming, down to earth. People that are low in openness prefer to be where they are. They look at the world, they see, hey, things are the way they appear to be. You know, what meets the eye. They wanna be down to earth. They wanna be very concrete. Uh, they wanna be very simple in terms of the way they, they think about things as well. And they don't see the value of the imagination. Uh, they don't see the value of, you know, exploring different ideas. Uh, it seems just like a novel waste of time for them. And it's also a higher cognitive load. So someone that's high in openness at their very core, every time they engage in this behavior, they're getting a reward. They're getting a boost. 
um, dopamine, serotonin boost in their brain, and it's elevating them. Uh, so this kind of also speaks to the deeper motivation here. Also, people that are high in openness are going to have a broad set of interests uh, versus having a narrow set of, set of interests. So now let's look at the structure of openness, and then we'll also look at what the key motivations are. So in terms of structure, um, people that are high in openness are going to have a large breadth of interests or hobbies, uh, things that, and experiences, things that they're learning. And so one way to think of it is that openness has a dimension that's both outward focused and a dimension that's inward focused, right? So the outward focused dimension is going to be interested in the aesthetics, and the creativity and the beauty and the music and the art and so on. Um, and it's going to have a wide breadth of interests. And the introspective piece is going to have a, de a, a deeper depth to it. And what that means is there's going to be a deeper density of association among things within, within this framework. They're going to be far more uh, interdisciplinary and they're going to be able to draw relationships between unrelated items much more quickly and easily which allows them to have a better, more complex, more accurate model of, of, of the world, if you will. In other words, they're, they're going to have a, a, a they're, they're seeking a broader view. They're seeking the big picture. The other thing they have is permeability. So this model is not going to be right. It's not going to be 100% correct. There's going to be areas where things are unknown, things are incorrect, and so on. And, and people that are high in openness know this. <laughs> so they have a very flexible uh, mindset and uh, they're very flexible, malleable in terms of what the boundaries are and they're willing to change things and tinker around with them. And so they're trying to improve this, this model. Uh, in terms of their core motivations, they have like a real need for cognition, in other words, to think deeply about things. Um, and, and then also, they don't have a, a, a big need for closure. Again, if things are not are open-ended, they understand that that's just the nature of, of the way things are. They're not going to know and understand everything. I think the best way to understand the core motivations of high openness is a personality trait, is that it's a personality trait that likes to explore the outer world through aesthetics, through music, through art. It also likes to explore the inner world through ideas and feelings, and they, it does it for its own sake. And then what it does is it, it creates this loop. So it'll go from exploring ideas and feelings, exploring the unknown. It might be some philosophical. It might be exploring black holes if you're Stephen Hawking, for example. And then coming from that exploration and then creating something, and not only something, but creating something that's meaningful and sharing it with the world. So if you're high in openness, chances are you have a real need to express your creativity in a meaningful way. Uh, that's why high openness people look for jobs that will give them that. They're very intrinsically motivated. They're not motivated by achieving a certain goal or uh, becoming wealthy or something like this. They're, they're uh, more uh, focused and more interested in uh, having an expressive, highly cognitive uh, job that's going to allow them to express their creativity in the world in a way that's meaningful. Now let's look at the, the NeoPi uh, facets. And depending on which personality inventory you use, you're going to get a different number of facets. For NeoPi, it's six. And I think these six are going to give us a lot of insight into the, the six main dimensions of the personality openness. And you might be high in some and, and, and low in others, or you might be high in all of them. Um, and they all have their own benefits that they, that they bring. So first is fantasy. Okay, and, and someone that's high in fantasy is going to have a very vivid imagination. Um, they're probably not going to be the most present person. They might always be in their head a little bit more. They might be daydreaming quite frequently. Uh, the next is aesthetics. Uh, aesthetics is an appreciation for art and appreciation for beauty. Uh, someone that's high in aesthetics is going to gravitate towards nature. They're going to gravitate towards museums. They're going to like to go to environments that are beautiful. They'll even like to create environments that are beautiful. So if you go into their home, for example, it might be a very distinctive and beautiful arrangement uh, of things at their home. Feeling. Now this is, I think, the most interesting. Uh, and that is that people that are high in openness have a real depth of emotion. 
that means that they have a larger number of differentiated emotional states. They, have a, they don't just experience the normal emotional states, they have a bunch of other emotional states that generally people low in openness don't get to experience. Think of them as emotional boxes that they're opening up and experiencing. They tend to be far more introspective. They tend to reflect. And what this allows them to do is it allows them to process their emotions in a more efficient way and to actually uh, address any sort of emotional issue or pain that they have, which, which means that they have higher emotional intelligence. They're also able to share their emotions more easily with their partners. Um, what this leads to is having a really high psychological well-being. So if, you have, if you're high in emotional depth, in essence, what this means is you're not, in, not in, running away from bad emotions or emotions that are painful uh, or experiences that were painful. You're addressing them. And as a result of you addressing them, you have better psychological well-being. This also correlates with uh, self-transcendence. So out of all the, the different facets, this one is the most correlated with that. And, and it's for all the reasons we already talked about. It's someone looking within and by looking within, dropping the things that don't work dropping the maladaptive traits. Uh, four is the action. So people that are high in openness are eager to try new things. Um, they might have something that they've already created that's really successful and uh, that's going to get boring rather quickly and then they're gonna try to new, do something new just for its own sake. Um, and they're eager to try new things because they're always tinkering with the world in a way. Ideas. Uh, people that are high in this facet, they're going to have a lot of intellectual curiosity. Uh, they're going to have a, a big need for cognition, uh, complex thinking. Uh, they're going to be interdisciplinary, as we already talked about. They're going to have a lot of breadth and depth. Uh, they're going to be verbally very fluent. Um, they're going to be humorous. Um, they're going to be intellectually engaging, and so on. And then last but not least is uh, values. So people that are high in openness, uh, correlates very heavily with being liberal uh, and then having a very low threshold for authoritarianism. So uh, whenever authoritarianism emerges somewhere in the world, the first people that notice are the people that are high in openness. All of a sudden, all their red flags start to go off and they're usually right. And then they go and tell the rest of the people in that environment and typically the other people don't see it until because it's, you know, what are you talking about? Look, there's no authoritarian. It usually takes people to, to see the threat, to, to know the threat, uh, but people high in openness, they're living in a, in, a, in a mental world where they're exploring different po possibilities and they're thinking in terms of probabilities. Um, and then, you know, based on this sort of dynamic, they're able to see certain possibilities and probabilities more clearly than people that don't engage in this way, that don't engage the world in this way. So um, let's think about, and let's talk about some of the life outcomes. So if you're high in openness, this is some of the stuff that's very predictive uh, in terms of uh, life outcomes. It's the number one predictor of a good life outcome uh, because it's associated with, with high IQ and creativity. Um, it's uh, people that are high in openness are intrinsically motivated. Um, they, ha they tend to eat healthier diets. Um, they tend to be healthier uh, in their appearance, better psychological well-being. They make bigger contributions to society because, again, the people high in openness are the ones that are creating all the new things, right? They're the artists, the musicians, the philosophers, the psychologists that are in the cutting edge, the entrepreneurs that are creating the latest new companies, especially in the technology area. Uh, they're the ones that are pushing the world, world forward. Um, the other thing, comedians, uh, people that are any sort of artistic thing, actors, they're gonna be high in openness. Uh, the sciences, you know, cutting edge physics, again high in openness because in all these areas you're dealing with things that are unknown you're dealing with the new you're dealing with a situation where yesterday's way didn't work and something new needs to be created and it needs to be better than what is already there um, it's also high in openness uh, people that are high in openness also have a, tend to smoke more more marijuana <laughs> So there's a positive association with marijuana smokers. And you probably notice that a lot of potheads might be, uh, tend to be higher in openness, especially in the artistic community, you see that a lot. 
Uh, however, it is uh, the relationship between high openness is negative with cocaine use in opiates. It's a natural protector against opiate use um, and, and, and cocaine use. And, and I think part of the reason why people that are high in openness are protected against this along with a bunch of other risky behavior uh, is because they're more intrinsically motivated. Uh, what, what cocaine does is it, it turns on your reward centers uh, very similar to the way serotonin turns on your reward centers in your brain. Uh, but, but these rewards tend to be uh, extrinsic in their nature. And so for extroverts, cocaine is a very uh, uh, dangerous thing to try because it turns on all the same uh, parts of your brain that your, extrovert, uh, that your extroversion uh, turns on. That's why you see this high association of, let's say, like day traders, people on, on Wall Street, and cocaine use because they're very extroverted, very goal-oriented, trying to hit the number, try, you know, et cetera. Cocaine turns out all the same uh, faculties in the brain. And then opiate use is usually uh, a pain um, suppressor. Uh, and if you're high in pain, so let's say you're high in neuroticism, opiates tend to be very appealing. If you're high in openness, it doesn't apply because you're processing uh, emotions in a deep way. So, so the pain isn't really there, and, and, and so the association with opiates is negative. Job satisfaction tends to be higher. Uh, people in high openness have more complex jobs uh, that require complex thinking. And whether they do better at the job or not only depends on the nature of the job. So in regular jobs, people that are high in openness will actually perform worse. In jobs that requires complex thinking, complex cognition, uh, creativity, they'll do better. In terms of relationship, this is the number one uh, trait that, pe that a couples try to match on. So if the couple is, high, if, if one person is high in openness, they're going to naturally look for another person that's high in openness. If you're moderate, you're going to look for a moderate. If you're low, you're going to look for low. And I think this is really important because uh, the gap between high openness and low openness is sometimes too large uh, to manage. If one person in the relationship is really, really high openness and the other one's really, really low openness, they literally see two completely different worlds. And it's going to be really hard for the person in low openness and high openness to relate to each other. The person in high openness, on the negative side, might even look down on the person in low openness and say, oh, you think in such a simple way. Uh, but it's important to know that <laughs> uh, the, you know, for the person in low openness, it's hard for them to think in this way because it literally requires more, it increases their cognitive load. The person high in openness gets a reward for thinking in a complex way. The person in low openness, you know, there's a price to pay to thinking in a complex way. Um, women tend to be more attracted to men that are higher in openness than they are. Um, and, 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 and also, people in high in openness tend to have the best um, life outcome in terms of success. I think this... This kind of represents itself a lot in the stories we tell. So, for example, if you look at the hero's journey, and there's many variations of the hero's journey, but the most popular one is that the hero who lives in a walled city, like in during medieval Europe or something like this, um, uh, has to leave the city in order to fight the dragon. And if he fights the dragon, one of two things happens. Either he gets a pot of gold or... He gets the woman because there's a woman stuck in a castle on the top floor. So either he gets to free the woman that's been kidnapped by the dragon or he gets the pot of gold. And, um, and this is a story that exists in many different cultures. It's one of the most popular mythological stories that, that has stood the test of time, uh, that's a prominent, you know, irrespective of culture. Uh, and, and, and even we see it today like in the movies that we watch, right? It's just a you know, more modern version of it. So what does this really mean on, on a more, you know, on a deeper way? What, what is it, what is the story, what's the real meaning of it? What's the real ethic of it? Um, essentially what it means is that the hero leaves the known and ventures out into the unknown and the unknown represented by a dragon is very strong and powerful and it could crush him and kill him in an instant. And the unknown is also represented by a reptile and the reason why it's a reptile is because uh, humans are naturally uh, afraid of reptiles. Maybe at some point we were we were hunted by reptiles. You know, they're a natural you know enemy of ours. So it's going to be a reptile. And the dragon isn't just a reptile. 
it's also the dragon is also really smart so you have to outwit them you have to be creative you have to think outside the box in, ter in terms of defeating the dragon because the dragon knows you're after his pot of gold right and so by leaving the the known the conventional uh the structure and going into the chaos now the hero faces uh faces the monster um and the hero defeats the monster and he gets the pot of gold in other words there's a reward to facing your fears and the reward to facing your fears is to get information on how to win that sort of battle which is represented by the by the pot of gold and now the warrior uh, the hero brings this back to the city and he shares the pot of gold or this information with everybody and now they're they're much better at defeating the sword of dragon the next time it's going to be some different dragon and maybe the next time it's a different dragon and they have the woman in the castle so you know why is there a woman in the castle well as the hero goes out to defeat the dragon again he's fighting the unknown he slays the dragon and one of the prizes is that he's going to be more sexually appealing so when he comes home from defeating the dragon all the women are naturally going to want to be with this with, with the hero so that's why women are more uh we see it we see it in the science too so in terms of uh, marriages <laughs> uh they tend to be more sexually satisfying for people that are high, higher in openness and that's because of the novelty component they're willing to try new things um, also uh, they end up marrying at an older age and having kids in an older age or not at all and when they do have kids people that are high in openness their parenting style tends to be a parenting style that is um, very very tolerant they try to create stimulating environments as parents they're very competent and they're very knowledgeable so having a parent that's high in openness is going to they're going to try to stimulate you in a number of different ways you know intellectually and artistically and, and try to really help you find your way i think that's a, a good way to, of thinking of it um so i hope that gives you an idea of what high openness is as a trait now how will you know if you meet someone that's high in openness maybe you're talking to them for the first time what are some of those markers that you could look out for and and remember that one you want to make sure that you're seeing this trait consistently over time because just because someone's curious about one thing doesn't mean they're a curious person and just meant they're curious that one time so you want to see if there's a, a consistency in their curiosity the second thing is uh, we want to differentiate to some degree whether it's a heritable trait or if it's a character adaptation if it's a character adaptation they just might be curious because it's part of their job and they need to know right and so they might be consistently curious but maybe they're only curious within a certain situation maybe at work and maybe within a certain a domain maybe like they're a marketer or something like that and they really need to know x y and z and so they're really curious about it or it just might be their specific particular hobby right so and when you're meeting someone for the very first time these are some of the markers that you'll know you're talking to someone that's high in openness uh, in appearance they might be very distinctive looking uh, and somewhat messy okay someone that's low in openness would be very conventional uh, they're going to dress in a very conservative style um, in terms of eye contact when it comes to like the camera people that are higher in openness tend to look away a little bit more uh, and so when they meet you they might be looking away a little bit more um, people that are high in extroversion are going to be great at maintaining uh, and they're going to give you far more uh, eye contact that, than any of the other any of the other traits uh, in terms of like language and the way they talk and they're going to um, they're going to be far more expressive in their language they're going to use more philosophical uh, and intellectual words they're going to use a lot more artistic and emotional words uh, in their in their conversation and um, in their office one of the dead giveaways that someone's high in, in openness is they're going to have a lot of books and magazines that are that have a variety of different topics so if you go into someone's house at home or office and you see it's a little messy and it has a distinctive uh, uh, look it's it might be also a very beautiful and aesthetically pleasing look and at the same time there's a bunch of different magazines and books about different topics and you know they're, they're really you know there uh, that's a, those are markers for high openness and then here's the number one marker for high openness so when someone's high in openness they're going to try to engage you in deep conversation almost right away 
Uh, they're not very interested in, in just talking for no reason at all. Uh, what they want to do is they probably already have something that they're exploring mentally and they might run some of those ideas by you. So uh, they're going to engage you in deeply philosophical uh, topics or deeply intellectual topics and they're going to use intellectual words in those topics. Um, so they're going to be focused on ideas when they're talking to you. The other thing that uh, people high and open is do is that since they have a, a large breadth of interests and they also since they also have a large uh, uh, depth in understanding uh, and a complexity, they're going to make better, better and more common associations between things that don't seem connected at all, right? So when you're talking to someone high in openness, you might be, you know, talking about one topic and then they might bring another one from left field that seems totally unconnected and then they connect it in this really interesting uh, novel original way. And then you're talking about this and then they bring something else out of completely left field and, and then they connect those two things in a really unique and interesting way. And, and those are the, the main ways you know you're talking to someone that's, that's high in openness. Um, once you get a few of these markers that they're high in openness, you can start asking them um, what they enjoy to do. Uh, what do they do for fun? Do they read? Uh, do they engage with different uh, abstract ideas? Uh, do they like to learn things? Um, are they, you know, do they like nature and beauty and music and art? Do they think it's important? As soon as you start to have a conversation around these traits, people love their traits. They think their traits are valuable. Um, and so when you ask them, are you this way? They're going to, they're, you know, when they are, they're going to tell you yes. So that's the, that's the next thing that you do is you, first you form a hypothesis around whether someone has these traits potentially because they're displaying them. And then you want to see if, if they value these traits. Um, and then the last piece is you want to see how they value these traits in connection or compared to other traits because no one is just one thing. So the next piece is number three, we're going to talk about combinations and permutations of traits. So once you've identified someone as being really high in openness or if you yourself are high in openness, um, these are some of the things that you need to look out for. Uh, these are natural uh, areas of conflict also within yourself and within teams. So the first one we're going to talk about is conscientiousness. So conscientiousness loves order and having things in boxes and it likes doing things in a conventional way because the, the conventional way has worked. Okay? So they have, um, they, they have an appreciation for tradition, right? And if you think about it, there's value tradition. It got us here, right? Um, the, the, the part where, where they're missing to some degree is that the world is always changing and that traditional solutions aren't always the best, okay? And so in a company, for example, or in a person's life, but more so in a company, someone that's high in openness is gonna have really unique and out of the box solutions to problems. These solutions, most of the time, might completely and totally fail. The few times that they succeed, they're going to represent, you know, somewhere between a 10X and a thousand X improvement. And just by virtue of, of this asymmetric benefit, it's worth exploring. But most of the time, these ideas aren't going to work out. People that are high in conscientiousness, on their hand, they, want to, they don't want to waste their time with ideas that most won't, mostly won't work out. They prefer to do things that they know are already working. And in large companies, most of the managerial team tends to be highly conscientious. And so they're unwilling to try new things. And this is one of the reasons why you know, tech startups or, or startups or small companies eventually overtake large companies. Because the large companies at one point uh, were a bunch of entrepreneurs trying to figure out the best way to do something. They figured out a great way to do something which was maybe the best way to do something at that time. Then uh, very, a lot of conscientious people came into the, into the company and did a great job of executing this plan. Um, and and, and while, the, while this is happening, Throughout, throughout time, the underlying environment is changing, and as the, ch as the environment is changing, um, this solution isn't as good as it used to be. It's slowly uh, degrading, all right? But the people that are high in conscientiousness can't see that because they have, um, they're really go good at going from point A to point B to being organized and industrious and carrying out a plan, but uh, you know, sometimes they miss the forest for the trees. They're, they're, they have a proclivity to go down a path uh, with great efficiency, but sometimes they might be going down the wrong path. So they're going to be going in the wrong direction really quickly. Um, and so 
this is where the value of, uh, of highlight openness comes in. The, they can see, you know, they can hover a helicopter, they can see the big picture, uh, they can uh, kind of come down to the complexity and the nitty gritty, and they can help realign long term goals. Uh, but there's a natural conflict between the two. One likes to explore and unpack ideas, the other one likes to keep things uh, neatly packed, and they don't like exploring new ideas because most of the time they're a waste. The next one is high openness and high neuroticism. So someone that's high in openness is naturally unpacking ideas, they have flexibility around mental boundaries, they're playing around with, with them, they're playing around with feelings, they're playing around with all this stuff. And this, uh, in essence, is you do this at the cost of sawing off what you know. Like for example, someone high in openness might have a business that works, might lose interest in it, and try to start a new business. What that means is they're kind of sawing off the thing that's working for them in order to try something new. Um, and this can be very nerve-wracking for someone that's high in neuroticism because you're giving up the known for the unknown and that's inherently dangerous and it, imp and it implies a lot of risk and so it could be very destabilizing for someone that's high in neuroticism. So that's how those two uh, play together. Um, the next is, let's say, someone that's high in extroversion and high in openness. Um, if they're high in extroversion in terms of the assertive side, they're going to see to it that they accomplish a lot of their goals, so it could be a, a, a good benefit. Uh, and, the, and if they're high on uh, the sociability side, the enthusiasm side, they're going to have really good emotions, um, they're going to be positive, they're going to be gregarious, so they're going to have the ability to inspire people with their ideas. So this could be a really dynamic combination, someone that's you know, gregarious and they think outside the box. And then imagine they're also high in agreeableness, which means they're compassionate and empathetic, and they can see things really easily from other people's point of views. Uh, that, that, that could be a really dynamic combination. So I hope that kind of gives you an idea of, um, of high openness and then how it plays with other traits. And if you like this sort of content, make sure you click subscribe, hit the like button, and you can watch all the other videos to have all the other, other traits uh, below as well. And I hope you have a great rest of your day.